Rupadaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adhvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare Okay. Let me share the screen. Okay, is everybody able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. We're on chapter number 30, right? Yes, Maharaj. Chapter 25 was the beginning of Kapila Shiksha, and we heard about devotional service, bhakti. Then chapter 26 was about Gyan and the description of all the different elements of the material nature and their characteristics, qualities. Then chapter 27 was about the application of that knowledge. And then chapter 28 was describing Astanga Yoga, meditation on the super soul. In chapter 29, last week we finished with devotional service and how a person may be doing devotional service but he may be in the modes of nature. He may perform the devotional service in goodness or in passion or in ignorance. All right, so today we're going on, chapter 30. It's entitled Adverse Fruit of Activities. So at the end of the chapter, well, Devahuti, she'd asked questions in chapter 29. She wanted to know about time and she wanted to know about the nature of the material world and birth and death in the material world. She wanted more understanding of it. So you're going to get it in the next couple of chapters. We're going to hear about the material world and the nature of birth and death and the effects of time. Let's begin with Sanatana Goswami's prayers glorifying Srimad Bhagavatam from Krishna Lila Stava. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O nectar churned from the ocean of all scriptures, you are the most prominent transcendental fruit of the Vedas. Enriched with the jewels of all conclusive truth, you grant spiritual vision to all the people of the world. O life breath of the Vaishnava devotees, O Lord, you are the sun which has risen to dispel the darkness of Kali Yuga. You are actually Lord Krishna, who has returned among us. O Srimad Bhagavatam, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. By your recitation one attains transcendental bliss, because your syllables shower pure love of God upon the reader. You are always to be served by everyone, 
for you are an incarnation of Lord Krishna. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O my only friend, O my companion, O my teacher, O my great wealth, O my deliverer, O my good fortune, O my bliss, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O uplifter of the most fallen, please don't ever leave me. Accompanied by pure love of Krishna, please manifest yourself in my heart and in my throat. Jai Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Okay, an overview. We'll begin with the overview of the chapter. The time factor. We were hearing about the time factor in the last chapter. So the chapter continues. We're going to hear more about the time factor. The time factor deludes the conditioned living entities and causes them to enjoy illusory satisfaction. And the time factor bewilders all of us. We're so caught up trying to enjoy the material world. Then, after introducing the time factor, Sukadeva Goswami, or Lord Kapila, goes in to tell us about householders, how they become bewildered, enjoying the temporary, as if it were permanent. They do, not, they do this until old age and death. So householder life, very bewildering, very easy to become oblivious to the, what's happening in the world. And we're thinking everything is eternal. The ch our children will always be children. Even though the children grow up, we still think of them as our children. So right through life, it, it's like that. And we're never prepared for death. Then after death, we will hear in this chapter about death. Then the bewildered spirit soul is taken for judgment, punished for his sinful attempts at enjoyment. So just to show how this is continuing with the previous chapter, in chapter 29, Devahuti had inquired about the effects of time and about the continuous cycle of births and deaths. And Kapila Dev started to answer these questions in the end of chapter 29. That's shown from verses 37 to 45, which was the end of chapter 29. Now, continuing in this chapter, Lord Kapila will speak powerfully with the intention of awakening renunciation in our hearts. So let's see how much you're going to be awakened to renunciation after hearing Lord Kapila describe the effects of time to us. Renunciation, vairagya, right? Det our detachment. So it's an important. We have to develop renunciation. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to teach us Vairagya Vidya Nija Bhakti Yoga. Vairagya, renunciation. Vairagya and Vidya, transcendental knowledge, along with devotion. Vairagya Vidya Nija Bhakti Yoga, Sharta Eka Purusha Purana. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Sharira Dari Kripambudir Yastuam Maham Prapadye. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya glorified Lord Chaitanya in this way, saying that you're the most, you're very merciful that you've come to teach us what had almost been lost in the course of time, and that was the process of devotional service enriched with knowledge and detachment from everything which is not in connection with Krishna consciousness. So Lord Kapila is going to speak also 
and his intention is to awaken us to renunciation. Uh, Lord Rishabdev also implored his sons. Remember, Rishabdev had a hundred sons, and he told his sons they should also do some austerity, some renunciation. Nayam deho dehabajam niraloke kushtam kamarna hatevid bujam ye te jo divyam putrakadena sadvam shuddha yadyasmad brahma shokyam twanantam. Prabhupada often lectured on this verse by Lord Rishabdev. Lord Rishabdev telling his sons, you have to do some renunciation. Because sense gratification is there for everyone, even the pigs which eat stool. We will hear in this chapter how even in the lower forms of life, they're also having sense gratification. Do you want that sense gratification like the pigs which eat stool? Do you want sense gratification like them? Or do you want real sense? If you want real sense pleasure, you have to do some austerity, do something, you have to become renounced, you have to become detached, and that will purify us, and then we can understand what is real sense gratification. Okay, from the second and third fourth part of this chapter. Whatever is produced by the materialist with great pain and labor for happiness, the Supreme Personality, as the time factor, destroys. And for this reason, the conditioned soul laments. The misguided materialist does not know that his very body is impermanent and that the attractions of home, land and wealth which are in relationship to that body, are also temporary. Out of ignorance only, he thinks that everything is permanent. So this is the situation in the material world. That we, we say the world is real, but it is temporary. The impersonalists or the Mayavadis, they're fond of saying Brahman Satyam Jagat Mitya, that only the Brahman is truth and this world is all false. We say, no, it's not false, it's not Mitya. We say Brahman Satyam Jagat Satyam. The world is also true, but it is temporary. Materialistic people, they cannot understand that this world is temporary. And they're always making arrangements, they're planning how to prolong their existence in the material world. Of course, they'll stay in the material world, but they have to take different bodies. We're, they're trying to make the body eternal. The soul is eternal. The soul never dies, but the body's going to die. The body's going to become useless. We're going to have to give it up. So, we have to understand this attachment for the material is the cause of the greatest bondage, as we heard in chapter 25. But that same attachment, when it's transferred to the spiritual, that is the, opens the doors to liberation. So time, uh, this is the time factor, and this time factor, this is Krishna. Krishna comes as time to take everything away from us. Another quotation from the purport, text number three. Out of illusion only does the materialist accept his home, his land and his money as permanent. Out of this illusion, the family life national life and economic development, which are very important factors in modern civilization, have grown. A conscious person knows that this economic development of human society is but temporary illusion. So illusion means accepting something 
to be something else. We accept something which is real, where we accept, or we accept something which is temporary, we accept it to be something real. Illusion means we're, we haven't understood the actual nature of the object. So Prabhupada describes the home, money, land, it's not, it's not eternal. We're given these things for some time. We have to learn how to use them properly. So a conscious person knows that the economic development of human society is just an illusion. We're talking about econo economic development simply means sense gratification, more sense gratification. We want economic development so we can gratify our senses more. That's the whole basis of materialistic philosophy, all based around the body, sense gratification. We have to transcend that. Okay? So, vairagya, yukta vairagya. How many other types of vairagya do you know? Anybody? Who's out there? Let me hear who's, who's listening to the class. Let me, let's ask some devotees. How many kinds of vairagya do you know? Jukta vairagya, markar vairagya, palmu vairagya. Yeah, palmu vairagya. Markat Vairagya, can you tell me what that is? Explain to me, what is Markat Vairagya? Uh, Markat Vairagya is the renunciation like that of a monkey. Yes, go ahead, tell me. Um, the monkey, externally it may seem that he is living on trees and just eating fruits, but he is very attached and he has many wives. Okay, yes, good. That's Markat Vairagya. Okay, what's another Vairagya? Somebody else? Jukta Vairagya. Huh? It means Jukta Vairagya. It no. means that we shall, we shall remain in the family, but we shall live plain thinking, plain living, and always remember God. That is Jukta Vairagya. We shall not renounce anything. But use that property or assets in the service of Lord. And that is Yukta Vairagya. Okay, Yukta Vairagya, utilizing everything in the service of Krishna. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Some other Vairagya? Falgu Vairagya, Guruman. Falgu Vairagya, okay. Tell me, what yeah. is it? Srila Prabhupada was uh, explained about the Falgu Vairagya, considered as like the uh, Falgu River. In the in the surface is like a sand, but in below the sand is the the water is still uh, uh, flowing like that. So the Palguya Ragya means that outside only we use maybe like a tilak uh, or many like a Vaishnava dress, but inside full of uh, desire for enjoyment. Well. I don't know if, if that is actually a description of Falgu Vairagya. I mean, that's, Maharaj, that's an, Maharaj, somebody, Maharaj, someone, Maharaj, just, Maharaj, just a minute, just a minute, I'm talking, please, just wait. But you see, if you say like, that is somebody's own identification, that they're having attachment to sense gratification, but they haven't, you, you know, you didn't describe that they've actually done anything wrong that within their mind they may be contemplate. So within their mind there's anartas, there's, there's contamination in the heart, they're not pure. But falgu vairagya, there's got to be some actual activity there. Something, they're doing something. Right? What, what is it? Yes, what do you want to say? What is falgu vairagya? False renunciation. So give me an example of false renunciation. Somebody else? Let's hear somebody else. Yes, Madhiji. 
um, uh, this is like the Mayavadi sannyasis. Uh, they say that they won't touch anything and so they want to give up everything. Uh, so Prabhupada calls that as false uh, uh, renunciation. Uh, whereas uh, we should be utilizing everything in the service uh, of the Lord. Uh, we should not reject anything which is there because everything is the energy of the Lord and should be used uh, in the service of the Lord. We should not reject uh, anything. So, so Falgu so Varagya is to reject everything? Uh, yes, to say that uh, everything, any, uh, that anything material will call, cause us attachment. So, um, like the Mayavadis, they want to give up anything. Hmm. And, uh, not uh, because they think that just by having money or uh, taking anything, it will lead to attachment. So, wow. they want to be away from everything. Okay. Having money. So, we know there was a famous man, right? Bengali. Yes. What, yes, did, yes, what, no. what, what was he doing? Why was he famous? Um, because he would say that, I won't touch money. Uh, right, yeah. He would say, I won't touch money. Money was on the table when he would put his hands on, no, no. Right? But did he touch money? Uh, yeah, he would say you leave it or something like that and they would use it, uh, not in front of everybody, but I think they would use yeah, it. Yeah, Prabhupada said below the table there was a lot of money. <laughs> On the table there's money and he's not touching it, below the table there's a lot of money. Now, other example, Falgu Vairagya, anybody? Prabhupada, yes, yes, Maharaj One example is that... Uh, many times people take a renounced order and at the same time in front of general public they act as renunciants but inside they are having a pair with three heads. That's one example. Yeah, but that's a subtle point. Uh, that's, you know, the, they, they may be in the, they may be, they may be renounced but they still have attachments. That's the contamination in the heart. But the Fogo Vairagya is an act of Rejection, right? They've got, it's got, they've got to actually show that they're rejecting something. Just like Prabhupada gives the example, money is laying in the street, right? And three kinds of people come by. One man is a karmi. He takes the money, puts it in his pocket, goes and spends it. Other man, he doesn't touch it, he's in maya. This Maya doesn't want to touch it, just leaves it there. So, and the devotee will take the money and use it for Krishna. So that one who left the money in the street, he said it's Maya, that is the Falgu Vairagya. They don't know how to use everything in the service of Krishna. So they reject everything. And certainly the, the, the Mayavadi sannyasis, they take renunciation to give up the world. Their mood is to renounce the world. They say, Brahman Satyam Jagat Mitya, the world is all false. So they give up, they, to give up the world. But in Krishna consciousness, a devotee takes sannyas to utilize everything in the service of Krishna. As mentioned, Yukta Vairagya, Yukta Vairagya, utilizing everything in the service of Krishna. Is there any, some more time, kinds of renunciation? Any other vairagya? Yeah. Yes. Smashana vairagya. Yes, right. Tell me. Yeah, so basically, uh, when somebody passes away, very close to, close to the, uh, close to us passes away, we go to the, uh, to the commission ground and we see the, we see the body actually getting uh, destroyed in the fire. Uh, then, then automatically, we realize that we are not the body, we are not, uh, we shouldn't be wasting our time cultivating uh, material sense gratification and uh, we should go back, we should cultivate Krishna consciousness. Uh, so this kind of, uh, when, when we are stuck with the shocking, uh, shocking loss of somebody very close, uh, we get this kind of a, uh, detachment. But usually that kind of a detachment lasts very sh on, a, on a very short, very short notice. Once we come back to our home and uh, we start our normal life, we, we for again forget the 
forget that uh, detachment. Yes, right. Very temporary renunciation, right. So the renunciation at the crematorium is smasna vairagya. Okay, yes, very good. Any other kind of renunciation? No, I don't know any other either. Okay, we'll go ahead. So, Mohad Grihashetra Vasani Vasuni. Out of illusion, only does the materialist accept his home, his land, and his money as permanent. So, materialistic people, they're very attached to these things the home, the land, money. You know, money dearer than honey. Prabhupada explains in the purport of text number three, when, however, one is enlightened in Krishna consciousness, he can use these for the service of the Lord. That is a very suitable proposal. Everything has a relationship with Krishna. When all economic development and material advancement are utilized to advance the cause of Krishna consciousness, a new phase of progressive life arises. So we're not against economic development and material advancement if it can be used in the service of Krishna. Right? We want to use everything in the service of Krishna. That's, that's proper use. No problem there. So Prabhupada understood. But it, it shouldn't be detrimental to our Krishna consciousness. Just like when Prabhupada first came to America, uh, he found out he could get a telephone fixed in his room very easily. You know, he'd been living in India, and in India, you know, it would take months and months, you know, a year or no, you have to wait before they'd come and fix a telephone for you. Because we're talking 1960s, so everybody had a landline, landline, and land, just to have a landline took a long time, it would take a year or more to get a phone fitted in your house. Then Prabhupada heard very easily he could get a phone fitted into his apartment. So he thought, okay, let's get, a, let's get a telephone. So he got a telephone, but then every, every day so many people would call up and say, how are you Swamiji, how are you Swamiji, I just wanted to know, are you okay, is there anything you need Swamiji, like that. So after, after Prabhupada had had the phone in his room for a week, he said, get rid of this phone. He said, it's just a disturbance. He said, just so much trouble. People call me all the time, little things disturb me. He said, I don't need it. <laughs> so, you know, what we thought is material advancement just brought so many troubles. Just like motor cars, you know, we think, oh, they're very good, very good. But look at all the problems they bring, all the pollution, all the traffic all the scrap, so much trouble. All right, so we're speaking about the problems of life. Problems come with the material body, and the material body begins with birth. Of course, actually even before birth, we're in the womb. So in the womb is also trouble. We will hear about that. Uh, probably tomorrow we'll hear about that in the womb. But birth is a problem. It's very risky. You know, so many ladies, it's difficult for them to give birth. Nowadays, of course, a lot of births are done by cesarean means, which somehow it makes it a little easier, but, but that's also very painful for the ladies. They have to undergo, and painful also for the child. The child is not really able to come out, the doctors pick him out, bring him out of the womb. So birth is difficult, and then 
with the material body, there's always a problem of disease. So many diseases are there. You know, before it was cancer, and now it's COVID. We had COVID-19, now COVID-21. You know, there's no end. There's no end to it. Disease comes. And if you're able somehow to put up with all the different diseases, you go on, you become old. And with old age, there's more difficulties. So many problems in old age. Problems digesting, problems walking, problems just remembering. Many difficulties with old age. And then finally, death comes. And with death, you have to leave the body. And when we leave the body, that's also a problem. Before we leave the body, it's trouble because if, when we leave the body, the body must be really broken down and bad health. And we're taken out of the body. And after we leave the body, then if we are sinful, we're taken to Yamaraj. We have to go and meet the God of death, right? That's one temple everybody goes to, the temple of Yamaraj. So these are the problems of life. So we want to understand about how the living entity is moving in these different conditions. So Prabhupada brings up the topic about how the soul comes into this world and how he's moving, right? These two terms are brought up, avaranatmika and prakshipatmika. Text number four describes the living entity in whatever species of life he appears finds a particular type of satisfaction in that species and he he is never averse to being situated in such a condition. The, the, it's the nature of life that we're, we're actually happy and that we become happy, we become conditioned to accept the condition of life which we are in. And Prabhupada gives the example about the pigs which eat stool. Hmm. They're eating the stool, but they're happy, they're thinking, very nice, here's our pig food. And so, this, and, and even in the most hellish conditions, even in the most hellish conditions, people are living and they're thinking, they're happy, they're having a good time. Sometimes when we go for book distribution, when we go on Sankirtan, to distribute books, we see people, some of the conditions which they're in, so unfortunate, so unpleasant. But they're sitting there happily all day. We wonder, how do they tolerate? So amazing. But somehow they do it. So this is the conditioning, that somehow we become satisfied in particular situation. But on the other hand, sometimes no matter what happens, we're never satisfied. <laughs> it, that, that although we accept our body which we're in, we're never satisfied with the different conditions. We always want more. We want more. There's always that pressure on the father that pressure is always on the mother. The child is saying, I want this, mom, I want this, dad, get me that. Yeah. <laughs> They're never satisfied. No matter how much you do, how much you try to serve people, it's never enough. But still, somehow we're satisfied to be in that species. See, people are thinking, oh yeah, we're, we're lucky, we're here. Where I'm an Indian, I have my Indian body. The conditioned living entity is satisfied in his own particular species of life, while deluded by the covering influence of the illusory energy. He feels 
little inclined to cast off his body, even when in hell, for he takes delight in hellish enjoyment. <laughs> it's so amazing that even they're in hell, they're thinking, I'm, I'm having pleasure, I'm enjoying here. The most hellish things they do, the conditions which they work in, the conditions which they live in, they're thinking it's enjoyment. So for some people it's enjoyment, it's not enjoyment for everyone. So the nature of the material energy, one is the throwing potency and the other is the covering. So here is the covering, the covering potency of the illusory energy. Because we become covered, the, the throwing potency, we get thrown in, out of the spiritual world into the material energy. Like that, that's the throwing potency. And then there's the covering potency. And that covers, we become so much covered, we, become, we identify with the body and we identify with our community, with our race, we identify with our caste, we identify with our family. And we're thinking, very nice, very good, you see, different species of life. This is true in all of these species. The birds, they're having, they're always talking to each other. We have many birds here outside, the I can hear them every day. Sometimes they're fighting with each other, often. And the monkeys, there you see the monkeys, how they live, how they enjoy, we heard Markata Vairagya, that they're very rascal, although they appear to be renounced. And look at this fellow, this four-legged pig. You know, he's also thinking, where's my pig foot? He's happy in the pig body. And we're thinking, poor soul, unfortunate souls in these animal bodies. How did they get these animal bodies? This is the results of their past karma. They're put into these conditions because of their sinful activities. And so they have to suffer in these different bodies for some time they'll live before they come again to the human form of life. So different families. What is our, our real family? You see we've shown here Krishna's family. But we are thinking my family, Maya. Maya's family. We're thinking this fam my family. I am the head of my family. But in Krishna's family, that's the real family, the family in the, the spiritual world. So Prabhupada explains here about this. The family we maintain is created by Maya. It is perverted reflection of the family in Krishna Loka. Our family is a perverted reflection. In Krishna Loka, there are also family, friends, society, father, mother, everything is there, but they are eternal. Here, as we change bodies, our family relationships also change. Sometimes we are in a family of humans, sometimes in a family of demigods, sometimes a family of cats, and sometimes a family of dogs. It's hard for us to appreciate when we're in the human body, but it's a fact. Just like Jad Bharat, he had to become a deer. He was in the family of a deer. Of course, he could remember and he was careful to get away from the family. But we're not so conscious of that. We become very attached and very concerned for our family. Of course, devotees should not be neglectful, but we should understand the reality that this family situation in this world is temporary. It is not eternal. We're with it for some time, and we'll, have to, we'll leave it soon. 
Prabhupada gives the example, just like you get in the bus or on the train and you sit in the train there with the people and you talk to them for a while. Then you come to your destination, you get off the train. You never see the people again. But while you're traveling with them, you're, think, you're talking with them, you're having a talk with them, you're enjo enjoying with them. Then you got off the train, bye-bye. So family life is like that. We come together for some time and in course of time we are separated, never to meet again. You never know who is your father, who was your mother, where did they go. Gone forever, finished. So we have to understand the nature of the material family life. It's the cause of so much attachment, and so much bondage, and it's all due to ignorance. So this chapter is very penetrating, very heavy. We have to hear it carefully and we should become inspired to also renounce. So this is text number seven, purport, Prabhupada explains, family, society, friendship are flickering and so they are called asat, asat meaning temporary, not eternal. It is said that as long as we are attached to this asat, temporary, non-existing society and family, we are always full of anxieties. Materialists do not know that the family, society and friendship here in this material world are only shadows and thus they become attached. We become attached to a shadow. This material world, this family, they're just like shadows. They're not real. You want, we have to overcome this illusion. And how to awaken, how to overcome? By hearing, we have to hear this knowledge, spiritual knowledge. All right, a little exercise for you. Reflect on an experience in your life when the principles described in Srimad Bhagavatam regarding the temporary nature of material family relationships became apparent to you. If you have somebody sitting with you, you might like to share with them. If you don't have anybody sitting with you, if you're alone, you may like to contribute yourself and I can hear. Right? Did you have any experience about this? Understanding the temporary nature of family relationships when it became very apparent to you the reality of this world and these temporary relationships? Maybe you didn't, maybe you never had that realization yet. So maybe you'll get it today by hearing. Maybe we can hear from others. Have you lost somebody in your family? Did you have you lost a friend or a loved one? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaji. Please accept my envelope, BC answers. Maharaj, I had this feeling when at young age I lost my mother. So in spite of all the efforts to save her, she could not be saved in spite of the fact that my father also was a doctor. Mm -hmm. And in spite of the best treatment, best hospitals, still we could not save her. So I had this feeling and I was very young at that time. So oh. I had the similar type of a feeling at that time when, I, when we lost her. Oh, when you were very young, huh? Yes, Maharaj. I was just in school. I just come up past school. Mm -hmm. Who helped you get over it? Did you have so a... This is my father. Yes, father. Yes, uh, Maharaj, it was my father. Like, it was just, he counseled me and uh, my elder brother, 
who has now renounced the world as an in, uh, now as in Vrindavan. So somehow you all helped me out of that. Oh. But still to this day, I feel it and I think about it and I feel that this is, everything is temporary. Yeah, you can understand the temporary nature of the world. So you don't yes, get Maharaj. you don't get so attached anymore. No, Maharaj, still the anarthas are there, so we so you know I tend to get into that attachment still. So please pray for me. I seek your mercy that the renunciation that you have experienced and you have undertaken in your life, I can also do it in the same way. Okay, very nice. Thank yes, you, we have to have some attachment. We cannot. Simply, we have to, well, as we say, we have to become attached to Krishna. And we see Krishna also in the heart of everyone. You know, everyone's a part of Krishna. And so we, and we have to understand the nature of this world. Of course, if we get some spiritual guidance, it can be very good. Sometimes devotees, you know, a devotee couple, they may lose their child. Naturally, that's a very painful experience to lose your child, a young child. And so the young child may leave the body, then it's very heartbreaking for the mother and the, all the family, they'll all grieve. So that time we need to hear, we need to hear from the scriptures, we need to hear about other activities. Just like uh, we had one couple, they lost a child, a very young child. So I, I gave them different sections. I gave them like the section from the Chaitanya Bhagwat, where Srivas Pandit's son departed from the world. And Lord Chaitanya came, you know, and as what happened and then he found out Srivasi's son had passed away in the night. So that whole section from Chaitanya Bhagwat, I, I told them to read this and then I told them also to read about uh, the teach the preachings of Haranyaksha. The Haranyaksha, although he was a demon, when uh, Oh, no, it was Haranyakashipu, right? It was Haranyakashipu. When Haranyaksha was killed, then Haranyakashipu was preaching to his family and relatives, and particularly to Haranyaksha's family, because they were twin brothers. So Haranyakashipu was consoling the family, and he was telling them, actually, the nature of death and the nature of the world. And he gave nice examples also to understand that you can't do any good just simply grieving for people who have passed away from the world. Because time is also coming, we're also going to pass away from the world. And if we spend all our time grieving for someone who's gone from the world, in the course of that time we will also leave the world. And he, he gave the example about the bird which uh, lost its mate, the, the female bird got captured by the hunter and the male bird was very, was grieving so much that his mate had become captured by the hunter that he also got caught, he also got killed. So Aranyaksha is preaching like that, so I told them to read this and you know these different sections from scriptures, they're very helpful to hear these things and understand and uh, then we can under, uh, we can appreciate more what's happening. Then of course there's also Maharaj Chitra Ketu and how his son died and the teachings he got from Angira and Narada Muni. So our scriptures really help a lot to understand the nature of the material world and they help us to cope with these kind of difficulties when they come on us. Would somebody else like to contribute here? Any experiences you had? Anybody? Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yeah. Uh, so 
basically, uh, I have had, uh, uh, before coming to Krishna Consciousness, I have had several relationships uh, with several, uh, uh, several girlfriends. So basically, you know, it has been like, you know, one girlfriend left when uh, she knew that, okay, fine, uh, this fellow's job is gone. And now he cannot provide the same kind of money and relation, same kind of lifestyle that uh, he used to provide. So she just uh, left me and she went to someone else who could give her that kind of money and lifestyle. So then I realized that, oh my God, you know, the whole relationship was just for the sake of money. He was with me just for money. So, <laughs> so that was one thing. And then, then there was another relationship where, you know, the... At certain point of time, she got bored with the kind of uh, physical relationship. So, so then she thought that, okay, fine, you know, that's it. You know, this fellow can't really satisfy me physically anymore to my expectation. And that was it. She called it a day and she said, okay, fine, thank you. And she moved on to someone else. And uh, likewise, uh, Likewise, uh, you know, I have had some, some other experiences like this where they are with me only for the material things, various material aspects. So then I realized that, you know, all this, uh, all these so-called uh, conjugal relationships are mostly like this. If it is based on material, uh, material, uh, based on material uh, motives. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, Prabhu. Very enlightening. Certainly your experiences there and having relationships with the fair sex can certainly bring you difficulties. So you remain sing single now, huh? So fortunately I found a devotee wife uh, oh. late now and uh, now I'm with a devotee wife who is helping, who is cooperating to perform devotional service oh, and that... to preach. Very nice, very nice. You found a devotee wife. Yeah, that's a solution. Very good. Thank you, Prabhu. Anybody else is there? Like to share? Yes, Prabhu. Yeah, I wanted to share. You know, I have been an investment banker and uh, I was handling a portfolio of almost uh, 700 companies where we had an investment of almost 28,000 crore rupees and 700 companies. So the point is, this was over a period of 15 years. So when I had made investments, the relationship and how I was treated by the companies where we had invested was totally different from that time when I had to go to them for the exit so that I could get the money back if we had invested. So the relationship was totally different, you know, diagonally opposite. Uh, Earlier they would, you know, give me a total DGI treatment and subsequently when I had to go for an exit so that they could get the money back, you know, uh, then they would not pick up my phone, they would not uh, entertain me, you know, they would uh, uh, keep me waiting in the office for five hours. So that had become a very common uh, thing. So it was all false, you know. <laughs> That's all right. Yes, very true. Yes, that's the nature of the material world. They're very eager to take the money and very, very reluctant to give it back. <laughs> yeah, very interesting experiences, yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead. So, uh, we're hearing about the, the, the man working in the material world, in the family, he becomes very much anxious to work for the family and to provide for the family. And it's very difficult to satisfy the family. Doesn't matter how hard you work or how much you bring them, it's never enough. You know, they need more, they need more. The children want a better school. Every child has to have their own handphone. Every child wants a own computer, uh, the wife wants more children, she wants a bigger house, they want another car, then the children, they want their cars, and then, oh, so many, there's so many pressures. So, then it comes to the man, you know, the working so hard, 
it's not easy, then his health suffers and comes to what we call the, the happy end. You know, the happy end, you know, the family all come, they hear, oh, father's not well, his heart problem, he may die, and everybody's coming to be with him, and they want to make sure, you know, when you go, be, be, when you go, make sure you leave everything to me that I should get. They're all thinking, when he goes, it will all be mine, the property was all coming to me, and this way the brothers all fight, and even the sisters fight, everybody's anxious to get the money of the departed person, to take his money. And the, the old man is, can hardly speak. One devotee was in the hospital, told me, he said he was watching this other old man. He, the old man was laying on the bed and his family had arranged a maid to take care of him because the man was helpless. He was just laying on the bed. So the maid was there and she was just watching television the whole day. She just sat there and watched television and the man just lay on the bed helpless. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't say anything. So he didn't, so sometimes the maid would put some water in his mouth or something like that. But he was just helpless. And the, the lady who was supposed to be taking care of him, she didn't do anything, just watched television the whole day. And the poor man is just laying there on the bed dying. And so this is often the way in old age, very difficult. Sometimes in the old age you cannot control the bowels and difficult. They, they have the man walking, they have the man all dressed in diapers all the time. And they don't want to put clothes on him because he cannot control his bowels. It's a very horrible, unfortunate condition. So, at the time of death, there's two destinations. One is, some people, they will go back to Godhead, the devotees. They're going to go to be with Krishna. And the others, who are not devotees, they're going to go to Yama. They will go to Yamaraj, to, and Yamaraj will decide what kind of body they have to get. So Prabhupada explains here from the purport text 13, it is judicious therefore to give up family attachment before one attains old age and take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One should employ himself in the Lord's service so that the Supreme Lord can take charge of him and he will not be neglected by his kinsmen. So in, in this section Prabhupada does speak quite a bit about the importance of somehow giving up family attachment. And he said, before old age comes, you have to give. That's why the Vedas say, pancha sorvam vanam brajit. That from the age of about 50 or a little over, you have to know it's time to get out of the house. Because if you stay in the home, well, you can stay in the home, but it's not so easy to stay in the home and remain detached. Just being in the home means you're going to, there's going to be attachment. Best is to get out from the home. And ideally, in older age, we are encouraged to go to visit holy places, go to live in the holy dam, go to go on parikrama like that do tirtha tirtha yatra go and see the different places of the pastimes of the lord chardam yatra is there also <laughs> these different things so this is very much recommended before you get too old because we know the body is temporary you have to give up the body therefore we have to prepare for the next life and the preparation for the next life is done by getting out of the home and going to here. Go to the Holy Dham and hear, hear the scriptures. Just like Mayapur, Vrindavan, every, so much kirtan is going on, so many classes, so many courses, so much opportunity to do service. It's a great 
purification, just to be in the holy dham. So that one who is intelligent, he will not remain at home. Because you remain at home, you take birth, you may take your next birth, you come back again. And you may come back as a servant. Prabhupada tells the story, the one man was very attached to his home and sons. He came back, next life he took birth as a cobbler outside the home. And he was repairing the shoes of his family. But his family didn't realize this was their father. The father had come back as a young boy and he was doing shoe repair. And then his sons came with their shoes and they beat this young boy with their shoes. So they were beating their own father. So take birth again, come back in the same family. It's not a good idea. We want to go back to Krishna's family. So we have to develop attachment for Krishna, means hearing about Krishna. So the time of death, when you have to leave the body, we meet these people, the Yama Dutas, right? The servants of Lord Yama, they come to take the sinful person from the body. And of course, you can see in this picture, Vishnu Dutas have also come, because this is Ajamila, this is from the Ajamil story. So this is described in this chapter. We, this, uh, uh, the Vishnu Duras, Yama Duras, that's the sixth canto, right? Here we've got <coughs> third canto, Lord Kapila speaking. So text 19 to 27, they describe about meeting the Yama Duras. What actually happens at the time of death to the sinful people? How this person is laying there in the bed, helpless, and finally it comes time for the soul to leave the body. So at the time of, at the time of leaving the body, these Yamadudas come. And the person will naturally, seeing the Yamadudas, is going to be terrified because they're very horrible, fearful looking people. And they're not in a good mood. And they've come to arrest the sinful soul, to take the soul to Yamaru. And they take, they don't just take the soul, they take the subtle body. The subtle body comprising the mind, intelligence and ego. It goes with the Yam, that's how they take the, the soul, along with the subtle body. They leave the gross body and take the subtle body with them. So the subtle body is material, but it can, ex it can experience pain. They can experience pain. And the Yamaduras, they take that subtle body. Just as the subtle body experiences happiness, it can also experience pain. So with the Yamaduras, they, the, the person experiences a lot of pain. Anyway, the point of the Yamadura's coming to take the, the person from the body, the person will become very afraid. So the doctors call this terminal restlessness syndrome. Terminal, terminal, time of death, restlessness. <laughs> because they're, they're seeing the Yamadura's, they feel very afraid. They know they're going to suffer. And so, very fearful situation. The, the, per, the soul, spirit, the spirit soul is taken with a subtle body by the Yamaduras and they take him to Yamaraj. And on the court, they're beating him and they take him a big journey, a big distance to Yama's kingdom. And he has to, he's beaten and whipped and it's very hot and there's nothing to drink and there's no food. So this way the person is suffering again and again. And they have dogs with them also. The Yamadunas have these dogs. And these dogs bite the person to remind him about his sinful activities. Dogs, hungry dogs. And they're biting, they're nasty dogs. Biting and 
coming, giving trouble to this soul who has to go to Yamaraj. So this is all described in some detail in Lord Kapila's teachings. So, coming to Yamaraj, he will decide what kind of body you have to take. We have to enter into different bodies. Let's read from the Bhagavatam. We can check what Srimad Bhagavatam has to say. Text. Okay. We're going to read about, can, are you able to see the text here? I'm looking at the text here. So 23, we want to hear about, okay, this is text. Uh, text 18 describes. Thus a man who engaged with uncontrolled senses, maintaining a family, dies in great grief, seeing his relatives crying. He dies most, most pathetically, in great pain and without consciousness. And Prabhupada explains, he completely forgets his real engagement to become Krishna conscious. Is always serious about planning to maintain the family, although he changes families one after another. You see, this is the point. We have many families. You're concerned about the family, but we've had many families. We're only thinking about this body family. At death, Going on text 19, at death he sees the messengers of the Lord of death come before him. Then their eyes full of wrath and in great pain, great fear, he passes stool and urine. At the time of death, the Yamaduras become the custodians of these persons who have strongly gratified their senses. They take charge of the dying man and take him to the planet where Yamaraj resides. And then it's described how the Yamaduras take the person as a criminal was arrested for punishment by the constables of the state. A person engaged in criminal sense gratification is similarly arrested by the Yamaduras who bind him by the neck with strong rope and cover his subtle body so that he may undergo severe punishment. So the subtle body experience, it's the subtle body which is experiencing all the pain, all the, just as we experience pleasure, the subtle body, we experience pain also. Then text 21 describes about the dogs. While passing on the road, he is bitten by dogs. He can remember the sinful activities of his life. He is thus terribly distressed. Describing more, going out to the court, going to Yamaraj, under the scorching sun, 
He has to pass roads of hot sand, forest fires on both sides, he's being whipped on the back and he's unable to walk, he's, he's hungry, he's thirsty, but there's no water, there's no shelter, no place to rest. He passes down that road, he falls down in fatigue, sometimes he becomes unconscious, then he's forced to get up. In this way, quickly brought to Yamaraj. Thus he has to pass 99,000 yojanas within two or three moments, and then he is at once engaged in the torturous punishment which he is destined to suffer. So we see how he is suffering and then we're told about the different kinds of hell which are there. He has some places they have to eat their own flesh or have it eaten by others. Other places there are these big birds, vultures, they come and they rip, they eat the body of the person. And then there's serpents and, and scorpions there just to bite you, to give you pain. And so it's not a very pleasant place. So much suffering, all suffering. Birth was suffering, after birth is suffering, death is suffering, after death is suffering. So everywhere there's so much suffering. How to get free of all this suffering? Our only hope is to come to Krishna Consciousness. So Prabhupada explains text 28, or Lord Kapila is explaining, men and women whose lives were built upon indulgence in illicit sex are put into many kinds of miserable condition in the hells known as Tamishra, under Tamishra and Rorava. So it's not that we're against sex, you know, there are some spiritual organizations where the people are told you have to practice strict celibacy. Even husband and wife are not allowed to have relationships and to have connection with each other. But in the Vedic culture, the, the, the marriage relationship is allowed and the purpose is to beget children. To produce good quality children is a great service. It's important. So uh, we have to understand the Krishna conscious philosophy in this matter. That we make use of everything and the desire to enjoy the opposite relationships with the opposite sex is also there and it's in Krishna consciousness to produce good quality children. It means children who can be devotees. This is very important. So Lord Kapila is telling his mother in text 29, My dear mother, it is sometimes said that we experience hell or heaven on this planet. For hellish punishments are sometimes visible on this planet also. We don't have to go to another planet, we can see hell here. There's hell. Prabhupada went to England, he said that was hell. He said every day cloudy, wet, cold, rainy, never see the sun. He said just like hell. And there's also the story about the one Christian man was preaching to, to minors and he was telling the minors that, you know, you have to be, you have to surrender to Jesus, you have to be, you should, you have to uh, take shelter, you have to give your life to Jesus to become God, God conscious. If you don't, you'll go to hell. So they asked the Christian minister, what is it like in hell? So the Christian man said, well, it's very dark, it's very cold, very damp. But they were minors. They said, well, every day 
we go in the mine, every day it's dark, it's cold, it's damp. Every day, it sounds just like where we go every day. So, the Christian man then said, and then there are no newspapers. And then they said, oh, no newspapers? Oh, that must be hell. How can we live without newspapers? Of course, nowadays we would say, now, there are no mobile phones, there's no Wi-Fi. People think, oh, no Wi-Fi, no mo mo mobile phone, how can we live? That will be hell, right? <laughs> so, the situation changes a little bit. But it's still what we think is hell. So, on this planet there's hell, there's also heaven. Some people have a lot of sense gratification and other people have it very difficult, have life very, very tough. So both situations are here on this one planet. It's not like you have to go to heaven to experience heaven. You can experience heavenly life here. But we should understand it's all temporary. It's not eternal. Text number 30. After leaving his body, the man who maintained himself and his family members by sinful activities suffers a hellish life and his relatives suffer also. Yeah. The, the, he, did, he maintained himself by sinful life. He maintained the family and himself by sinful life. Maybe he is maybe selling meat or alcohol or something like that. And this way he's maintaining himself. So it's a hellish life. And the family, they're also suffering. Because all of the money came by sinful activities, so that it's, it's all suffering, it's all misery. We should understand the responsibility of human life. And if we live off another person's sins, it's not good for us. It's very bad. So we want to be honest, we want to live in an honest way and earn for ourselves honestly. Otherwise, it brings more suffering. Text 31. He goes alone to the darkest region of hell after quitting the present body. And the money he acquired by envying other living entities is the passage money with which he leaves this world. So at the time of leaving the body, of course, you go alone. Nobody's going to go with you. You have to go alone. That's the story. There's a story. The man was going to die, and he, want, he wanted to know. He had, he had four wives, so he wanted to know if any of the wives would go with him. So the first wife, who he loved very much, he was saying to her, I'm going to die, will you come with me? And she said, no way, I'm not going to go with you. And so the second wife, he also liked her, but he was always worried she would go off with other men. So he asked her, when I die, will you come with me? And she said, well, if you're going to die, I'll find another man. I'm going to go with somebody else. And then the third wife, she was good in helping with the business and taking care of the family. He asked her, will you come with me when I die? She said, I'll come with you to the crematorium. I won't go any further. But then the fourth wife, he asked her, she said, I will go with you. That fourth wife represents the super soul. The super soul, the Lord in the heart. He's a real friend. And he said, I will go with you. The first wife, who wasn't interested? The body. The body's finished at the time of death. It's not going to go anywhere. The second wife who said, I will go with others, that's the money, the property. It's all taken by others. At the time of death, you leave your home, you leave your property. Every, they'll take everything. You don't have to worry. And the other person said, I'll go with you to crematorium. That's the family and friends. They'll go with us to the crematorium. After that, they won't go any further. 
So you go alone to the court of Yamaraj. But you leave the body, you take your karma with you. Just like if you earn money in a dishonest way, then you can't take the money, you don't take the money with you, but you take the karma with you. That karma accompanies you at the time of death into the next body. You have to be ready for that, to take the karma. You had to leave the money there, your family, they get the money, they also get karma, but you also get karma too. And that karma causes suffering in the next life. We don't escape the karma, we don't just leave the karma behind. It goes with us in the subtle form. So from the purport I noted, the great learned scholar Chanakya Pandit said therefore, that whatever one has in his possession had better be spent for the cause of Sat or the Supreme Personality of Godhead because one cannot take his possessions with him. They remain here and they will be lost. Either we leave the money or the money leaves us, but we will be separated. The best use of money, as long as it is within our possession, is to spend it to acquire Krishna consciousness. So, this is a warning to all of us, whatever money you have, you want to use it for the service of Krishna, then you get benefit. If you don't use it for Krishna's service, others will come and take it, they'll use it for maya, for sense gratification, and you get the karma. So we have to be very careful, very conscious. When you get the money, money is chanchala doesn't stay with us for long. You want to use it quickly in the service of Krishna. Okay, go, going on, text th 32. By the arrangement of the Supreme Lord, the maintainer of kinsmen is put into a hellish condition to suffer for his sinful activities, like a man who has lost his wealth. When wealth is lost, there is no use lamenting. But as long as there is wealth, one has to utilize it properly and thereby gain eternal profit. Text 33. Therefore, a person who is very eager to maintain his family and kinsmen simply by black methods, certainly goes to the darkest region of hell, known as Andatamishra. So we're hearing about the death of a person in the mode of ignorance, doing many sinful activities, he's going to go to hell. This is what happens, people die in the mode of ignorance, they will go into the mode of ignorance. They have to go and suffer in miserable, horrible conditions. Sometimes they will take birth in the lower, lower species of life. Prabhupada remarks in the purport, if a brahmana who works as a priest so that he may enlighten his followers with the spiritual way of life is not qualified as a priest, then he is cheating the public. One should not earn money by unfair means. The same is applicable to a Kshatriya or to a Vaishya. It is especially mentioned the means of livelihood of those who are trying to advance in Krishna consciousness must be fair and uncomplicated. Here it is mentioned that he who earns his livelihood by unfair means is sent to the darkest hellish reason. Otherwise, if one maintains his family by prescribed method and honest means, there is no objection to one's being a family man. So this is important point. We have to be honest, we have to be truthful, don't take unfair advantage and lie and cheat 
just for the sake of maintaining others. One should be conscientious about our situation. So, certainly there's no problem in being in family life, but be honest and understand one's duty. Having gone through all the miserable hellish conditions, having passed in a regular order through lower forms of animal life prior to human birth, and having thus purged of all sins, one is reborn again as a human being on the earth. So Lord Kapila is describing what happens to the soul, that you have to go to hell, you get punished, and then you're put into un animal bodies, gradually you come back to the human form of life, you've got rid of your sins, you come back to the human form of life. So we have to understand how to make proper use of the family. If one has been a devotee, of course, then you will take birth in a good family. If we have done some devotional service, even if we're not perfect, we will take birth in a good family so that we get the opportunity to again take up Krishna consciousness. Prabh Prabhupada said here in the end of the purport, it can be concluded that if someone is not willing to enter into hellish life, as in Tamishra or under Tamishra, then he must take to the process of Krishna consciousness, which is the first class yoga system. Because even if one is unable to obtain complete Krishna consciousness in this life, he is guaranteed at least to take his next birth in a human family. He cannot be sent into a hellish condition. Krishna consciousness is the purest life and it protects all human beings from gliding down to hell to take birth in a family of dogs and hogs. So, of course, nobody wants to be a dog or a hog. I hope, right? Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Are you able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, Maharaj. So we just read this purport. It's very instructive. Intelligent people, they won't want, want, want to take birth in the family of dogs and hogs. So if we practice Krishna consciousness, even if we're not successful, we can escape entering into the lower species of life. Prabhupada explains, from, this is from the previous chapter, chapter 29, which we read last week. No one can live within this material world eternally. The phenomenal world is created, maintained and destroyed by the finger signal of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Not Prabhupada's expression here. The finger signal of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, a devotee does not desire anything in this material world. A devotee desires only to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This servitude exists eternally. The Lord exists eternally, His servitor exists eternally, and the service exists eternally. Would anyone like to comment on what is Prabhupada's meaning when he talks about the finger signal of the Supreme Personality of Godhead? Only Hare Krishna. 
Yes, Manaji. Thank you, Mr. Maharaj. Uh, finger signal. Will of God. By the will of the God, everything is manifested in in the cre creation. By the will of God, everything is going on in this cosmos. Yes. So? So? Everything is going so, on by the will of God? So, so we have to understand that what is the will of the God, then uh, we have to act according to will. So, everything is also destroyed by the will of God. Yes, because this is the nature of material. Yes, right. So, what is the relationship then between the material world and the Lord and time? This material world is full of misery. We have to go back. Got it. So how does time come into into it? Uh, how should we regard time? Time can change everything. Yeah. Can, uh, with the time we can see the destruction but yeah, Time destroys everything, yes. Therefore, how should we, how should we relate to the material world then? If time destroys everything, is there any point in us building a big temple in Mayapur? Dhamma. Huh? Dhamma is internal. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Dham is eternal. Dham is, Etern is eternal, but the big temple is not eternal. Yes. So my question is, should we build a big temple in Mayapur? Yes. Yes, why not? Just. Well, if it's temporary, it's going to fall apart, right? But we, uh, but so many conditioned souls get benefited uh -huh. by the temple. So, how to understand time and this? It is so it will not... Yes, what do you say, Prabhu? Our Mayapur temple is paraphernalia of our supreme personality Godhead, so it cannot be destroyed. This is my thought. Okay, that's a, that's a little... I believe, I believe. The Lord's paraphernalia. Yeah, that's spiritual. Mm, but the Lord's paraphernalia, you know, just like the deity clothes, you know, but the, you could say deity clothes are the Lord's paraphernalia. Uh, they, all, they wear out, they get old, we have to replace them. Uh, for washing purpose, so that it looks nice to the people. To the devotee, that's why we are washing or taking, bring replacement, and again put on, again we are giving the same clothes after some time. That is okay. Prabhupada makes the point about the value of time. What is the value of time? Engage ourselves in Krishna consciousness 24 hours. Yeah, but how valuable is it, time, you know? What is it? Um, once lost, uh, even if we buy it for a million dollars, we cannot get that moment back. Right, yes, one moment lost. Any amount of gold cannot buy one moment of time. Yeah. So time is a very, very valuable thing. So we have to make the best use of time. 
So what is the best use of time? All his remaining days in Krishna consciousness. Right. We always we want to use every moment in the service of Krishna for our Krishna consciousness because we know that this time is very it's it's very precious, a very, very valuable thing. So don't waste time. Use every moment, every second for our Krishna consciousness. Use it to help us to remember Krishna. So the time, of course, is Krishna. It's Krishna himself is coming in the form of time. And he's showing us also how powerful this time is. It takes everything away from us. We come together and everything will be taken from us in the course of time. Our body will be taken from us. And the body, the thing we're most attached to, we don't like to give up the body, but the body will also be taken from us at the time of death. We have to give up the body. So we have to prepare for that. It's the problem, we're not just only attached to the body, we're attached to the extended body, the family, the home, the country, all of these things are keeping us in bondage in the material world. We have to give up that attachment. And that's why Prabhupada talks about, you know, leaving the home, get out from the home. He said, if, the, if in the home people are not helpful to Krishna consciousness, then better to get out, better to leave them. Don't try to change, you, you, you spend your whole life trying to change them, they may never change. So some, at some point you have to, we have to save ourselves before we can save the family. We have to think of ourselves, right? Become Krishna conscious ourselves. First become Krishna conscious ourselves, then think about trying to save others. But if we can't save ourselves, how will we ever be able to save, serve, save others? So it's important for us to show example. Get out from the home, don't remain at home. At least in the mind, in consciousness, we shouldn't be in the home. In consciousness, we should be in the holy dam, in the holy place. It's not possible. Everybody can go to visit the whole, go and live in the holy dam. Sometimes it's better to just stay, but be with the devotees. Try to get association with devotees. That's important. Go and be near a temple. Live near a temple where there's an association of devotees, where we can have an opportunity to have Krishna conscious association and to hear the holy name and to discuss the glories of the Lord. It's important. Get the right association. All right, are there any questions on this chapter? Thank you, Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Please accept about this discussion. Maharaj, just now there's one slide Maharaj showed, earlier slide says that in spiritual world also we have friend, society, father. So in Krishna Loka, so I try to understand the, the meaning of father, how how we can have a father in our spiritual world, in Golakavandam, I mean in Golakavandam, because there's no birth in uh, so how to understand the word father is there, Maharaj? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just like we, oh, there's some echo there. The cowherd boys, they have their mothers and they have their fathers. Some people, they have Vatsau, they're in Vatsauya Ras. They're in the mood of being Krishna's mother and father. You see, all the, all the cowherd ladies, the gopis, the elderly gopis, they were, they all, although they had their own children, they loved Krishna more as their child. 
So cowherd ladies, they were Krishna's mother. And we heard also how Putana, she went back to Godhead to be one of Krishna's mothers in the spiritual world. She was one of the nurses. And the cowherd men in Vrindavan, Nanda Maharaj and all of his friends, the, the cowherd men, they all love Krishna and they have a fatherly relationship with Krishna. They think of Krishna as their child. So this is how you have fathers. One may go to the spiritual world, one may be like a friend of Krishna. So you have also fathers, you have a father, the relationships are there. It's not that only Nanda Maharaj is there and he's the only father. And there are many other fathers also there. They're in the mood of being Krishna's father. And they care for him just like Nanda Maharaj cares for Krishna. They also think of Krishna as their son. Just like the gopis, they think of Krishna as their child. And when Brahma stole away the cowherd boys, at that time all the cowherd ladies, they all got to be Krishna's mother. Because their sons, their son was t replaced by Krishna. Krishna took the place of all the cowherd boys. So all the different cowherd boys went home to their mothers and the mother didn't know, the mother thought it was their own son, but actually it was Krishna. It was Krishna disguised as their son. And the, the, these mothers, they had more love for Krishna than they had for their own son. So just like Krishna had relationship with the gopis as mothers, so Krishna also had relationship with the cowherd men like his father. All the different elderly men in Vrindavan, they have that mood of caring for Krishna like a father. Therefore, in the spiritual world, you can also have a father and mother. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, sorry, uh, one more question. Maharaj, just now you mentioned that uh, how strong is the illusion uh, energy bonding the people to this material world? So, uh, Maharaj, uh, here sometimes we go for uh, prayers where the Hindu community after the death, uh, 14 days after the death, they have a kind of a Sraddha ceremony. So, usually we'll go and do our prayers. But uh, we've been doing prayers for the last 10 15 years, Maharaj. Not even one person who came for the Sada ceremony, who saw the person have left, not even one person, maybe one or two, uh, most of them don't even uh, realize that they're going to die, the same situation going to happen to them. My question is that, Maharaj, what we can do to break that ignorance, Maharaj, to, have, to let them have little realization that I'm going to go through this situation also, you know. So wh what we can do, Maharaj? So you should be praised and everything, Charlie. But how to break that ignorance? Because there's so much in ignorance and, I mean, so pitiful. So what we can do, Maharaj, you know, in that, that uh, kind of situation, Maharaj? How to break that ignorance? Well, we have to understand these people, generally these people, they're having the prayers, they're just doing it as a ritual. It's not like they're actually looking or thinking about alternative or about trying to understand the nature of the material world. They simply do the cult, they simply have the prayers as some ritualistic ceremony, some tradition which they do, but there's no thought about there's no thought about higher understanding, uh, about spirituality, trying to know about the truth. They don't have that desire. They're, they're not, re they're not in inquiring. They don't have that intelligence to see how to bring them in, how to... We simply try to give, try to give them the opportunity by going there, by doing prayers and so on, it's very good. They get some benefit, but they have to have a lot more prayers. They have to have a, they have to, 
It's not just hearing one time, you know, just the hearing one time you convince them. Because we have to understand these people are very attached to the family, they are very attached to the material life. And you come along and, and somebody dies and you talk about it, it, it you know, it, it, they just sit there. It's not like they're actually desiring to hear, but they're just simply, they're just present there. But if you ask them what you said and did they understand what you were talking, you know, it doesn't go in, it goes in one ear, it goes out. Nothing, nothing goes in the heart. Because they don't have that, they don't have that nature to inquire. They're, they never had spiritual education, they had only material education. And so when these things happen, they, they, they can take advantage of the mercy of the devotee. The devotee comes along to give something valuable, but they're not able to appreciate. What can you do? It, it's, how to bring them about is if, if, if they were in more distress, if the distress was greater, or if they had more pious, if they had more piety, then it might help. But piety in itself is not the cause of bhakti. What you really want, you want to give them bhakti. So we try to give them bhakti, it, it, it's hearing is really important. They have to hear, but they shouldn't just hear one time, you know, they, they, you have to think, you have to hear more, you have to give them more and more. And so, it's like that. You come along, you're coming, you're just coming along, it's just a ritual, oh yeah, the Hare Krishnas are coming, they're going to do the prayers. And they just sit in the prayers, but it's just the prayers. They're not thinking that you're coming to give them spiritual knowledge. They're not thinking you're coming to save them from material life. You're coming to liberate them from birth and death. They have no desire. They don't think about that. This is, they, oh, you're just doing the prayers. The prayers, okay, prayers are over, okay, now enjoy. So if they were actually inquisitive, you see, they've got to be in the mood that they, they, they really want to hear, they really want to understand, they're really looking for something then it can be a different situation. But most, most, for most people it's just, it's just a, a ritual. The prayers are just a ritual. Otherwise they would never sit in here. That's a fact. So how to help them? Anyway, you help them because you did come, you did speak and you did chant Hare Krishna. You chanted the holy name, so they got some benefit. So they'll go on gradually. You make some. They make. They gradually, it will take lifetimes maybe before they're actually ready. Because it, people, most like most people, they they don't have an attack. They don't have a desire to understand anything higher. All they know, eat, sleep, mate, defend. They never thought to ask, why am I here? Why am I suffering? Never think about it. They never think, what's the solution to birth and death? They have no understanding about the soul. Very unfortunate situation. What can be done? We are devotees, we have to preach. Who wants to hear? That's a problem. <laughs> Difficult to get people to willing to hear. And even you, like at prayer, somebody died, they're there, they're there only because, only because somebody died. Not that they really want to hear, right? It's not that they really want, they're not looking for any guide, they're not looking for a guru, they don't, they don't want to know. They, they're just there because somebody died, so we sit in the prayers. As soon as the prayers are over, okay, it's all forgotten. So difficult. Yeah, this is a situation. We have to be thankful ourselves that we have to be thankful for the opportunity to 
try to give them some Krishna consciousness. Whether they take advantage or not, sometimes. But Bhagavad Gita says, out of thousands among men, hardly one is endeavoring for perfection. So it's like that. You go through thousands of people. We have to preach to thousands of people. We distribute thousands of books just to get one person a little interested. And from thousands of people who are a little bit interested, maybe one will become a devotee. And devotees are rare. Yeah. But Krishna is in everyone's heart. So we, we have to do our duty, we try our best to give them some Krishna consciousness. We try to bring them a little bit along the path. What can we do? You can lead the horse to water, you cannot make it drink. So it's like that. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Any other question? Comment? Anybody? No? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna. Uh, if you want, can you explain how you came to Krishna consciousness and what is your feeling now? Well, how did I come to Krishna consciousness? Well, I. I got a book. You know, I heard about Krishna consciousness when the devotees first came to the UK. I heard about them coming and I remember they'd made, a, they'd made the record, the chanting of Hare Krishna and we used, I used to chant. Of course, I didn't know anything about Krishna or Krishna consciousness. But the devotees had made the recording of Hare Krishna and then the Govinda record also. And I remember purchase, purchasing the records and playing the records and enjoying the music, very nice. And later on, uh, later on, I used to get some incense which the devotees were making. The devotees. Krishna devotees, they, they were making incense and I used to purchase their incense. And on the packet of incense it said to, we could go to the temple and visit the temple and they had a program and they said they had sunrise meditation and a Sunday love feast. So I thought I'd love to go sometime. So I never went and, but then what happened, I got a Krishna book one day from a book from a store not from a devotee, just in, uh, from a shop. I purchased a Krishna book. And when I took it home, I, my friend saw it and he said, oh, well, I have a book by this person. And he had a book called The Top Most Yoga System. And so we, we, I started to read The Top Most Yoga System and I, I really liked it. It really made sense to me. You know, I'd been thinking about getting a guru and I'd read a lot of books about other gurus and different teachers looking for truth. I was looking for truth, trying to understand more. I always had a lot of questions about life. Nobody could give me answers. But when I read the books by Prabhupada, everything he said made sense. I wasn't very happy with the books read, written by other teachers. But the books which Prab the book which I read by Prabhupada, everything I thought about, I think I can understand it. So that was unusual because the other books, it was always hazy, what they talking about, you know, I didn't know what they were talking about. But Prabhupada's book was very clear. Anyway, so I, I went to the temple and, and you know, I went to the temple and I met the devotees and I was talking with them. And you know, they were they were talking, asking me things, and I, I thought I knew more, but then I found whatever I said, they could defeat me, you see? And so I saw their philosophy was better than my philosophy. And so I decided that it would be good for me to live with the devotees for a while. And so I began, I used to stay, I used to stay in the temple and I would go to work in the daytime. And uh, I would stay at the temple at night, not 
well, first I used to come to the temple, and then they told me you can stay overnight. And so I stayed overnight and got, went to work. And then after some time, then a few weeks, they told me you should, you should give up that job and just become full-time devotee. And so I said, okay. So I gave up the job and I joined full-time. I thought, for some time, I'll join. <laughs> so I'm still here, still trying to be a devotee. And what was your age, Maharaj, at that time? Uh huh? At the time, what was your age? I was uh, 21, 21, 22. I just graduated from university. I had a college degree. I graduated from university and I was working in London on a job. So I, within a few months, I worked in a job a few months and then I joined Hare Krishna, became full-time devotee. Hare Bol. Hare Krishna, thank you, man. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Okay, so we will stop here today. I have one question. Yes, Mariji. Uh, um, that uh, in this day and age, it is not very easy to go away from family or as, it, as being in a woman's body also, uh, the psychological setup is there. That as a woman, I am dependent on in all stages of my life, then how I will develop that detachment being in the woman's body or from the family? Yes, well, you have to cultivate the detachment internally. You have to cultivate attachment to Krishna. You don't have to change your situation, but you do have to change your consciousness and your level of awareness. We have to see everything in relation to Krishna. Just like you have a family, you have to see that they are also part and parcel of Krishna. And they are given to you by the arrangement of Krishna. You have a family, Krishna has put you in this family. And so you, you recognize this as Krishna's arrangement for you. And you see the family also as parts and parcels of Krishna. And you have, and you are also part and parcel of Krishna. And are you the only devotee in the family? Your family are not devotees. No, all of them are devotees. But I'm thinking that I'm also attached to them, being my father, brother. Everyone is a devotee, initiated devotee in the family. No. Oh. But still, that attachment is there. So yes. How can I not be uh, attached and at the same time be detached? Well, we talk about yukta vairagya, right? You have to use your family in the service of Krishna, that they're all devotees, so they like to do service to Krishna. So you don't have to be, you don't have to give them up, you can remain with them. They're not against you practicing Krishna consciousness. So you continue in your situation and cultivate Krishna consciousness. You do your hearing and chanting, just like Lord Kapila told his mother, you know, you have to become attached to the sadhu. You have to become, you have to get initiation, you have to become, have a spiritual teacher, and you, and you have also association with other devotees. So you become attached to them in relation to Krishna. We don't have to go away from the world. We have to keep the world in contact with Krishna. So attachment will be there, that is natural, it's the nature of the soul to be attached. But when the attachment is to Krishna and those in relation to Krishna who are engaged in Krishna's service, then that attachment is not harmful, but that attachment is purifying. Right? You have a father, bodily father, and you have a spiritual father also. And so they're both fathers. So you be attached to both of them. And you have brothers, you have spiritual brothers also. So you be attached to all of them. You see them all. It's not not bad. No harm. Just use everything. So and... Thank you, Swami. Thank you, Swami. Just come in, come in.
don't need to know how to do it. Go and go and chat me. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisances. Um, uh, please forgive me for my ignorance. Um, uh, this, uh, I, I wanted to ask a continuation on uh, Yadurad Prabhu's question that uh, there are fathers and mothers in the spiritual world. Uh, because of the material intelligence and thinking in a materialistic way, uh, it's very difficult to conceive like uh, father, for, for our limited vision, Father and mother means that there must be birth at some point. But we understand that there is no birth in the spiritual world. So uh, is the birth like uh, spiritual as Krishna has in the spiritual world of everyone? Or, or how do we understand the father and mother concept? Well, how, how, how we get some idea from Brihad Bhagavat Amrita. We hear about the travels of Gop Kumar how he's going there to the spiritual world and he meets people there in the spiritual world. And so they have families, they come with families. How do they take birth? Well, Gop Kumar, he got to the spiritual world by mantra. He went with his mantra and he was able to trans transfer himself into the spiritual world. And sometimes just be arranged, sometimes Krishna would just take him into the spiritual world, even without his mantra, just because he was so absorbed in thought of Krishna, that Krishna would take him and transfer him and, and he would find himself in the spiritual world. Just like you have a dream and, some, you know, and, and he, would, he would just open his eyes and he would see he was in the spirit, in a, in, in, in Goloka, it would just happen that Krishna would transfer him. So when the body becomes spiritualized, the spiritual body, of course for the spiritual body there's no old age and disease and death. Is there birth? No, we don't, real, we don't hear about birth being there in the spiritual world either. But we, we simply appear there in the spiritual world. We have our spiritual body, our spiritual body, our spirit soul is contained in a material body here. But when we are liberated, we'll develop, our, our spiritual body will be manifest. Not that we have to take birth to manifest the spiritual body. We'll just simply be there. You simply appear there in the spiritual world. We have a particular form Maybe you're in the mood of a cowherd boy, or maybe you're in the mood of a gopi, maybe you're in Vaikuntha, you don't know. In Vaikuntha there's so many different living entities. But if you read the second half of Brihad Bhagavatamrita, you can read about the travels of Gop Kumar, who was a cowherd boy from Govardhan, and he got a mantra by his guru, and by the grace of the guru's mantra he was able to go to all the different regions in the material world, and then he travelled into the spiritual world. And it describes about the existence in the spiritual world. How people have, they can take many different forms. They all possess yoga cities, and they can appear in all different species of life, simply for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. They can take the form of trees, they can take the form of flowers or birds, or worms even, they simply can transfer, transfer they can trans, just uh, transfer themselves into different bodies by yoga powers. So it's inconceivable to our limited mind because we are conditioned here in this material world. But if you, you know, you, by reading books like Brihad Bhagavatamrita, you can understand a bit more. And when we go there, Krishna, then we'll see. We'll all be revealed. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yes, any other questions? Anybody? Uh -oh. Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, uh, 
Uh, the Lord is there in the center of our heart. So once we leave the body and those people who are leaving to hellish conditions and uh, the Yamduts are taking him, at that point of time also Lord is there in the part of the shuttle body. He is still there? Yes. Yes, because so because soul is there. No, the Lord doesn't feel any pain. Of course not. No. Well, he feels pain to watch the the the, the living entity suffer. That's painful for him. He doesn't like to see others suffer, but he doesn't feel the pain which the the living entity goes through. But he feels compassion. He feels sorry for him. That's why the super soul is there. That's why he's accompanying us, trying to guide us. He's waiting for us to turn to him. But these sinful people who go to hell and who are punished by Yamaduras, they cannot understand the Lord is there. They don't think about the Lord in the heart. But the Lord is there. He's with us. He's accompanying accompanying us throughout the material world, through all the different species. Thank you, Maharaj. That was very enlightening. Thank you, Maharaj. Ma Maharaj, sorry, uh, one more question. Maharaj, uh, just now we read one verse says that uh, the journey to the hell, uh, Yamaloka, is uh, 792,000 miles and uh, it is uh, 99,000 uh, yojanas and it will take two, three moments only to reach there. So I'm a bit confused because uh, the soul uh, leaves uh, on the 13th day after death to Yamaloka and it will take approximately about one year to reach Yamaloka. So that is uh, mentioned if you read Purnapadya Prabhu's uh, trans uh, translation of Garuda Purana, it is mentioned there. Even in uh, one uh, article in uh, Iskon Desire 3, we can uh, understand that the soul will leave the, uh, the earth on the 13th day after death, and it will take about one year to reach Yamaloka. That's why we do the monthly uh, Pinda offering and also uh, yearly uh, Shraddha. Because uh, after one year, the soul will reach the Yamaloka. But here he mentioned two, three moments, Maharaj. So I'm a bit confused with that, Maharaj. Well, there's going, there's going to be different conditions. Different. It's not going to be the same for every soul. You know, to say that some souls take 13 days and then before they leave the body, that, that's a long time. Other souls... No, no. Not the body, Maharaj. After that, on the 13th day, the Yamaduta will come and take the soul towards Yamaloka and that journey will take about one year. No, but you see many people have had death experience where Yamaduras came to them just at the point of leaving the body. The Yamaduras come just before the death and they're taking the soul out of the body right at the time of death. Yeah. Maharaj, one more. I spoke about this to one sannyasi, that is a Bhakti Mukunda Maharaj in Malaysia. He's a bit expert in this. He said that, Maharaj, I haven't read that, but uh, he, this is the, the, what he told me. The moment the soul leaves the body, Yamadutta will come and take to Yamaloka, and uh, the soul will stand in front of Yamaraj. And Yamaraj uh, will ask the soul, uh, Chitra Gupta will open the book and read all those uh, scenes done by the soul. And uh, Yamaraj will ask the soul, you have done so much of sin, what is your uh, pari, I mean, uh, atonement? And the soul could not remember anything. So the Yamaraj will take a Yamadanda and a hit on the head of the soul. That's where the soul will remember everything. And the soul will cry and the soul will tell that my children, my wife, my relative will do the atonement. Then Yamaraj said, okay, you, now you go back and see. And this way the Yamaduta will bring back the soul to earth and the earth will, I mean, the soul will remain on the earth until 13 days. The soul can see everything, all the funeral ceremony, everything up to 13 days. 
So only 30 days the Yamadutta will come back again to take back the soul uh, to Yamaloka and that journey will take about one year. Initially when the Yamadutta take the soul immediately, that will take about one muhurta, that means 48 minutes on our earth. That's what uh, narrated to me. So I'm a bit confused when we mention uh, this, this verse mentioned two, three moment. Is that Prabhupada uh, Kapila talking about the initial journey of the soul to Yamaloka and then come back to earth? Uh, uh, or the 13 day journey which take one year according to Garda Purana. So I'm a bit confused, Maharaj. Well, we're just working with what information we have here in Srimad Bhagavatam. You see, if you're going to take things from different Puranas, you can come up with many different descriptions. I'm sure different Puranas will all say different things. You know, to, so to come up with, say, Garuda Purana says this, you know, then definitely you're going to get confused. Let's just work with what's in Srimad Bhagavatam. You know, we're talking what, what Lord Kapila has told us. We don't know. But, we don't need to worry so much about what it says in Garuda Purana. The point is the soul is going to leave the body and the sinful people are going to be taken by Yamaraj. That's what we're thinking about. We want to avoid that. We want to understand that. We want people to understand that you do sin, you'll get punished. The Yamaduras are going to come and take you. You know how many days it takes and what happens and everything, that's all, that's all details. It's going to vary. It's going to be different. Some souls are more pious. They'll leave the body quickly. They'll take a new body quite quickly. Other souls, more attached. They don't want to leave the body like that. It's very complex. It's very complex, you know. So to bring up stuff from the Guru Purana, you can't apply it a whole, in, in the case of everyone. Some cases it may be like that. Not in every case. Let's just work with what's in Srimad Bhagavatam. The principle is, you go to Yamaraj. That's the principle. The other things are more details. But certainly, you go to Yamaraj. The point is, you die in the mode of ignorance. The Yamaduras take you. you. It's a hellish experience. You go there and punished. And then you take an, an, an animal body taking birth in some lower species of life after being punished, you put into the animal bodies, gradually you come back to the human body. So that's the point. And so if, if we take to Krishna consciousness, we can save ourselves from that. This is a... We just, we don't, we, we don't want to get too much into the details about how many days and what happens, you come back and, you know, that's not important. What's important is we get out. We don't go at Yamaraj, we don't want to go there. We want to practice Krishna consciousness. Krishna said, sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, if you practice even for a little while, then you go to the higher planets, you come back, you take birth in a wealthy family and you have the opportunity to again take up Krishna consciousness. So that's the important point. You do even a little bhakti yoga. Swalpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat can save us from the greatest danger. A little advancement made can save us from... So this is a, what we want. We don't want to worry about Yamara. Forget Yamara. We're not going to go there. We're finished with no way. We just want to take up devotional service to do Krishna consciousness. Yamaraj, he's got his business. Our business is bhakti. Let's just focus on bhakti. Bhagavatam is preaching bhakti. It's telling you, just do a little bhakti, you can avoid all this problem. Thank you, my much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Uh, my question is, if, if a man can raise to the level of Vaishnava, so while elevating to the stage of Vaishnava, he crosses the mode of patient and mode of ignorance. Now, can he, a Vaishnava, can he be again uh, commit some mistakes in passion or 
mode of ignorance after he, uh, he he has been elevated to the platform of Vaishnava. Again, he can can he again commit some something like un, under the different modes? Yes, you can. Vaishnava means he's in the state of goodness. Yes. Yes, you're in the stage of goodness, can but me... but may not be pure goodness. Yeah. It may not be pure yeah, goodness. Yeah. So that means it's still there's a chance that again you're influenced sometimes by passion, sometimes by ignorance. Oh, I see. Okay, Mark. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll, we'll, yes. we'll meet tomorrow. Yes. We'll go on tomorrow morning. Okay. Any other question? Are you okay, Prabhu? Just, yeah, goodness is the beginning. We got to transcend, we got to get free of the passion and ignorance, then only. So, the, but there's always a danger if our devotion is mixed. If it's not pure devotion, then it's mixed. And the mixed passion can come, ignorance can come. We have to avoid it. Hare Krishna. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Yeah. 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 Yeah.